Welcome everybody, my name is Stephen. And I'm Yvette. And today we are in the last of our series entitled The Illustrated Gospel. And today's message is called uh, Fight to Live. And this has been a great series. It's been wonderful to be able to connect with you guys. And if you've missed any of this series in Timothy, you can always go back to our YouTube page and catch the last four of these and get all caught up and just be uh, able to share with other people what we've been able to go through. It's been great. And next week, we're actually starting our spiritual growth series entitled Knowing You. And the week after that, we have great opportunities to jump into small groups. So if you're interested in joining any small groups, today is a good day to sign up. Go ahead and go to obcc.groups and you'll be able to sign up today. You know, there's been a lot that's been going on and some people have lost loved ones and our church wants to really just support those people. So we have this thing called group share, uh, uh, it's called grief share. And that's just a class for people to get together, kind of support each other. And so we are doing that in person. We weren't able to do that, but now we are. And that starts August 11th. So if you're interested in that, just text to the number down at the bottom of the screen. And lastly, beach baptisms are in a month, September 12th. So if you want to sign up today, go ahead and text BAPTISM to that same number on the screen to sign up today. Now, if you've missed any of these announcements, you can always download our church app, and then there you'll be able to get caught up on all the latest stuff. You can also follow along with the series on our church app. Take any message notes that you want. All right. Well, enjoy the service. <laughs> Bye. Welcome. This week, I wanted to share with you guys a song that many of you may know if you grew up in the church in the 90s. Um, it's a song called Above All. And I grew up singing that song, and then one day I was at a worship conference when I was in high school, and Paul Balash, who wrote the song, was explaining how that song came to be. And he had been trying to write this upbeat anthem, you know, above all powers, above all kings above all nature and all created things. And when it came to the chorus, he just couldn't find it. He didn't know where to go. And, and the song just wasn't working. And so he had a friend that he passed the song off to and said, can you help me with this chorus? And um, when they met up again, this friend of Paul's had changed where the song was headed. So instead of going from above all kingdoms and above all thrones to a triumphant chorus, the turn was crucified, laid behind a stone. And it just about knocked him to the floor. And when I heard that story as a teenager, it just about knocked me to the floor too. I was like, wow. The God who really is, is above everything, who, who is his worth is immeasurable, crucified, laid behind a stone. And um, so if you know the song, sing along or pray the song. Um, yeah, let's worship together. Above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were there before the world began, above all kingdoms, above all treasures of the earth. There's no way to measure what you're worth. Crucified, laid behind the stone. You live to die, rejected and alone like a rose. On the ground, you took the fall and thought of me above all. Above all. 
Jesus, we thank you. Um, we thank you for the cross, God. That even though you had all authority and you were perfectly content, you didn't need us, but you chose us. And God, we're just reminded that there's nothing that we can give to you that will add any value to who you are. Um, Lord, it's all a gift. We are humbled. We just stand in awe of you. The one who died to save us. We call you king. We recognize your power and authority over our lives. And we pray that you would come and just take over every area of our hearts and our minds and our lives and, and anything that's going on in our world, God. We love you. And we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Giving back to the Lord is a way to express our trust. It says in Proverbs, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He'll direct your paths. I love this, and I think it's so true of our finances. When we put God first, when we give Him the first of our income, when we give Him our time, our talent, and our treasure, he does so much more than we can imagine. So much more. He does it here in town in Corona. He does it in the greater area in California through the people that are serving him. He does it globally. So I would just encourage you guys, go to the website, find a good place to give to, whether it's to the missions, to the building fund. We certainly are praying for uh, things happening down the property, uh, down south in Temescal Canyon. Uh, you can give to the tithe directly, but let's express thanks and faith in God in this way. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much that you've given us all that you've given. Help us to be faithful stewards. Lord, all the things you've given aren't ours to keep. They're yours. And we just pray that you would take what we have, whether we're giving it to you directly in this way or whether we're giving it to the people around us or whether it's things we're investing in. Lord, I just pray that you would just help all that you've given us, all of our resources, help it to build your kingdom. Use it to bring your praise and your glory in this city and in this nation and in this globe. 
and we do pray for the missionaries who are out, that they're building your kingdom there. I pray that more and more people would be coming into your glorified, restored, heavenly kingdom. And when we see that wonderful city we're looking forward to, Lord, that there will be people there with you from every tribe, nation, and tongue. Thank you that we can have a small part in that and give to that today. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The other day I found myself driving to Target after dropping off my son's friend and walking in there, my son didn't even have his shoes on, which is a whole other story and a long trend in my family. But we, we go into Target and we're kind of going around looking at the aisles and I'm headed back to one thing. I gotta get hot dog buns and I've gotta pick up a digital antenna. Yeah, I didn't do that back in that big transition. And so we've never had digital TV. We don't really want digital TV, but it's the Olympics, man. We got to watch the Olympics. And so we literally bought a digital, a digital um, you know, antenna to watch the Olympics. And I have enjoyed it so much. I don't know about you, but I like watching elite athletes do some of the most incredible feats from world records in the 400 hurdles and the 400 meters and all these kinds of things The swimmers going at. It helps me want to be motivated to be energized and exercise and get out there. And I absolutely enjoy it. Maybe because I have a history in track and field and my wife was a swimmer and these kinds of things. But the bottom line is I find that though it motivates me to get out there to get physically fit, uh, it's also starting to motivate me in another way. I really, really want to be somebody motivated for the gold in the spiritual life. I don't know about you. I want to go for everything. I don't want to just have a mediocre spiritual life. I don't want to just kind of show up in heaven and go like, hey, God, thanks for saving me. You know, what's next? I, I want to have a passion for him. I, I want to honor him. I want to see him use us all greatly. And I, I believe that is the heartbeat of every Christian. And yet, and yet, I'm an on-again, off-again Christian, to be honest. Man, some, some weeks I'm screaming at it. I'm reading the Bible. I'm studying the Bible. I'm, in, I'm having awesome prayer times. I sense the Lord's presence helping guide my thinking and decisions. I'm fighting off temptation. And other weeks, man, I'm all about me. I'm, I'm all about the news. I'm all about that temptation. I'm all in all that junk. And it's frustrating because, man, it is a fight. It is difficult to go for the gold in this world. And, and sometimes we're just like, well, what does it mean? And to be quite honest, I show up for church. Maybe you watch these videos and you're coming as part of the church life here online because you want some kind of help, some kind of boost, some kind of important uplifting moment in your life to keep going for the gold in the spiritual life. And today, I just want to encourage you that maybe we want to let the scriptures encourage us to that gold. I think that we can just open the word today and allow that to, to motivate us because I think that's what Paul was trying to do. So would you be willing to open your heart up, willing to allow the scriptures to encourage you today to get back on track, to get back moving towards the goal, get back towards Jesus. And if that's you and you're with me, man, we're going to close this series out with a bang because I'm excited to just uh, dive into this final push, exhortation from Paul to Timothy. It's found here in 1 Timothy chapter 6, and so if you have a Bible, you can go ahead and go there with me. And what we're seeing here is, um, is we're going to start in verse 11. We're going to go down. We'll skip over a spot. So just as a background, if you're joining us, maybe it's the first time you've been watching. Somebody invited you. Welcome for, to, uh, to Olive Branch, by the way. But um, you're new to your Bible. Well, 1 Timothy in the back half of your Bible. And what we've been doing is looking at a leadership book. This book is the 
leadership book of the Bible, one of three of them. And Paul, the apostle, a great leader, a great church planter, is training his protege in how to clean up the church and to point to good, healthy ways of living, but without losing their faith and removing false teachers. In fact, it's a focus on the teachers because as the leadership goes, so goes the church. And as we look at this, we realize that that means Timothy in this book is a model for the Christian life. That you and I are to live a life, and a Christian or non-Christian, in a model that matches us with the same kind of love, the same kind of care, the same kind of passion to illustrate the gospel of Jesus Christ in this world. And I want to encourage you guys to, to let Paul's final exhortation call you to that gold, call you to that great living, call you to that great illustrating of the gospel. And so if we're going to go for the gold, we're going to find out the first thing we're going to be challenged to is this in 1 Timothy, is to go for the gold in the gospel. Let's, let's, let's pursue great character then. Let's push after great character. And he starts this way. If you want to look at there, verse 11, it says, But as for you, O man of God, flee these things, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. We looked at this briefly last week. I want to dig into it now. First and foremost, he tells us, oh man of God, this is, this is something that all of us can be. You can be a person of God. You can be a woman of God. You can be a man of God. We can be a person who is after God with all of our heart. And I think that's what it means to go for the gold. As for you, you who are striving to be men and women of God, you who are going for this, here's what I want you to do. First and foremost, I want you to flee from these things. Now you're like, what are these things? Well, the whole book has been laying out what these things are. Uh, the entire series in 1 Timothy, which goes back all the way to last November and further, is this opportunity for you and I to dig in and see that we need to flee, first and foremost, heresy. We need to flee any false teaching that points us away from Jesus, away from his gospel, because these things destroy the gospel. And you can't illustrate the gospel, and you can't live that ultimate life if you don't believe the things of the gospel. And so we need to be ready and willing to say, hey, you know, there's some things in my mind and my heart that come from the world that don't match with the Word of God. And we need to test those things and flee from them, run from them. We need to flee from divisiveness in the church. We don't need to build up evil suspicions and fight each other like we talked about last week. We don't need to be dividing each other up because that's what the enemy wants. He wants disunity in the church, not a unity. We want to agree on the basics, have great conversations and love on where we disagree, but we don't need to divide. We don't need to be angry at each other. We don't need to be like, oh, it's over. We need to just gather together, be careful, continue to bring unity and harmony to the church and love one another. Hey, but we also need to flee finally from, from greed, he told us last week. Man, we don't need this love of money. We need this, that equation, godliness plus contentment equals wealth being used for the gospel, right? We need those things. We don't need the love of money and more riches and more stuff. So flee from these things, he tells us. Run from these. Okay, that's great. Where do I run to? And that's, that's what I love about the Bible. It never tells you to leave one thing and just go nowhere. It tells you exactly where to run. And so he tells us what to pursue. He says, first of all, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, and gentleness. You know, as I've said, I've struggled over the years to, to keep myself faithful and, and exercise physically as well as the exercises spiritually. And I found something helps me. I need to write down a goal. I need to have that target weight or that target amount of reps or that target amount of times I'm going to be in the Word. And I found that when I have a target goal that I've published with a friend and, that, and we keep each other accountable, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to move forward. What I want to do is I want to give you a way, something to write down. I want to give you some questions, six questions that line up with each of these. I'm going to ask you to have a pen ready. I'm going to ask you if you need to pause or whatever, get out your phone, open your notes. Because what I want you to do is I want you to set an alarm so that every night, every morning, at some point in your day, you're asking these six questions to yourself. And you're writing down those answers and you're going to tell that friend, your spouse or whoever, hey, this is what I need to work on. This is what I'm aiming at. Because I believe if we were just to, to see these things pour into our hearts. We're to pursue this kind of character, man. You'll be going for the gold. And so let's start with this. Let's say we want to pursue righteousness. Now, righteousness does not mean righteousness with God. It would say the righteousness of God. That's given to you and me in Jesus Christ. When we stand before God in eternity, if you've trusted that Jesus Christ 
has taken your sin and your punishment, taken hell for you at the cross, rose from the dead to, to give you a new life, that you've been born again, then God's righteousness is upon you. However, this means we need to still live rightly with each other. We need to live rightly with men. We need to treat one another with a righteousness, a justice, a care. And so the question I want you to ask yourself is this. What do I need to make right today? We've all done things that may have caused harm, caused injustice. We may have treated our wife or our children or our husband or our cousin or somebody on the street uh, inappropriately. We may have said mean words. We may have done wrong things on the internet. You need to stop yourself and while you've confessed these things to God, ask yourself, how do I make it right? What do I need to make right? Because that's to live righteousness and pursue that, do it. It may be that you gotta eat crow, Man, make the cookbook. You know, figure out how to do that in every way possible. But we need to ask ourselves, what do we need to make right? Because we want to pursue being right with others. We want to pursue this idea of living with self-sacrifice. We want to pursue this idea of, of loving and showing off the gospel. And so that next part is godliness. The whole book of 1 Timothy is about godliness. And again, it is living a life that matches the gospel. It is living a life before God so that you can stand right before Him and that He's saying, yeah, what I've called you to is, is equivalent to what you're doing. And so the question I think that we should ask, and the second question for godliness is really this, what can I do to please you, Lord? What can I do to please you, Lord? God, there's something that you're asking of me to do in the scenario at work. What, what can I do to please you, Lord, in my devotions? What can I do to please you today? It's not to make him happy with us in the sense of like to save us. He's never more pleased for us, but we want to respond to his pleasure. We want to respond to his love and say, God, I want, to, I want to do things that make you happy. I want to do things that make you excited. I want to do things that go for the gold. What can I do to please you? Maybe it's he calls you to share the gospel with somebody. Maybe it's that you know you need to kind of care for that person this week. Maybe it's that you know you need to spend some time in prayer and just talking to the Lord about the things that you need. Or maybe it's just you need to get into the Word of God and just read it and, and let God speak to your soul. Maybe it's to take that deep need from the addiction or the struggle and the anxiety to Him and just say, God, I just lay it to you. This pleases you that you would take care of it. But what can you do to please the Lord right now. And that's really that thing that we pursue godliness after. Now, he goes on, he says, I want you to have faith and love. These two things go together over and over in 1 Timothy. And so we, we can't really separate them, but, but we're going to put them in a category of this idea of living a life in which we trust God and, and from that trust are willing to sacrifice for others. And so the first question when it comes to faith, when it comes to trusting God, is what do I need to trust the Lord in or for today? So when your alarm goes off, when you're looking at this question, you're stopping yourself to say, what is it that I need to trust the Lord in? Is there something that you're putting it in your hands? Is it that financial struggle? Is it that health problem? Is it that discipline with your children? Is it the singleness that you feel? Is it the, the sense of purposelessness that, that you're feeling about how things are going in your life? What, what is it that you need to trust the Lord with? And, and then to bring it to Him. So God, I, I gotta, I'm trusting you in this. I'm just going to release it. And this is a process of just letting God handle the things God handles so that you can handle the things that are right for you to handle. So what do you need to trust the Lord in today? What do you need to trust the Lord for? What does He need to bring for you? And so as you answer this, write it down right now as we're working through these so that you can begin to consider these things because we want to pursue trusting God, having faith in Him. Also, we want to pursue loving, loving other people, loving God. And so who can I care for today is the question I want to ask myself. And, and what will it cost? Because to care for someone, to love someone is always going to be at a cost for myself. It's unfair to me to love someone else so they can be better. It's unfair to me to love my children so they can be better. Because, and, and that's good. It's right. And so who can I care for? Is What neighbor? What, what coworker? Who is in the church that has a need? Who is it that is in my society or in my house that, you know, I just need to set aside my, my screen time, my play time, my, my own personal time because I, I need to step into my children's schoolwork or I need to step in to my, my wife or my husband's struggle for this day. What is it going to cost me? And so acknowledging that helps you make that right sacrifice. 
There are things that we can do every single day so that we can step into care for someone. And we need to write that down. Set those goals. We want to pursue the gold of love. We want to pursue the gold of faith. We want to pursue the gold of this idea of endurance because the next question really is how do we bring steadfastness, endurance into our lives? And the question that you need to ask yourself, what is it I need to not give up on? There are things right now the enemy is calling you to give up on. You shouldn't give up on your marriage. Don't give up on your marriage. What is it that you need to not give up on? Right now, maybe it's that child. You don't want to stop pursuing that child. Don't give up on that devotion. Don't give up on that exercise. Don't give up on that diet. Don't give up on these things. And yet right now, your body, your life is screaming to quit, quit, quit. If it's a godly thing, don't stop. What is it that you don't need to give up on? And ask the Lord, show me, reveal that to me, and then ask Him for the endurance. Ask Him to train in you steadfastness. It takes grit. It takes muscle. This is what enables us to go for the gold. This is what enables us to keep pursuing and moving forward. If we don't have that endurance, man, we're not going to form this character. And so, God, help me stay on track today. What is it that I need to not give up on that I'm so ready to quit on? And then the last one, because we want to be a people who honestly are loving. The last one is gentleness. And what's interesting is this term basically means to have, be mild, uh, to, to not be harsh with people, to not be overbearing and uh, power upon them. And so the question I want to ask ourselves is with whom and with what do I need to calm down, <laughs> right? Where do I just need to calm down? Who do I need to just calm down with? And I'm a, I'm a parent of teenagers and I pretty much can answer this question at any moment of the day when I'm having to do discipline or something's bothering me. Because so often when I see my kids, I see something that is, is like me that I don't like and I need to calm down. Maybe I need to calm down with myself. Maybe you're too harsh with yourself. Constantly pounding yourself and beating yourself up for the things that you've done wrong. Maybe if God's calling you to be gentle with others, maybe He's calling you to be gentle with yourself. So let's ask this question, with whom and with what? Do I need to calm down? Write it down. Ask God to give you the, the power and the patience and the love to be able to have this fruit in your life, this character, because it's this character that enables us to pursue the gold. It's this character that pushes us to press forward and to, and to reach out. And can you imagine what a church would be like if we had this char- these characteristics? If everybody knew someone they were going to care for, if everybody was being gentle, if we had this faith that God was going to provide for us, so we weren't striving for the money, we weren't running after these things, but we had this godliness in which we were doing things to please God because we loved to please Him, that we, we knew that we did something wrong, we were making it right. Can you imagine what a church would be like? Can you imagine how magnetic it would be to bringing people to Jesus? Can you imagine how your life would be and how magnetic it would be if this is the kind of thing that you were doing? Because the church is made up of people. As the leadership is supposed to do this, so the, people, we're suppo- the church is supposed to do that, that means you and me, we are supposed to be people of this kind of character. Pursue it. Go for the gold, guys. Don't give it up. This is going to be awesome if we see it, but it means one thing. It means that there's a struggle. There's a fight that we're going to have, and that's exactly what we see. To go for the gold in the gospel, we, let's at least fight for the best life. Let's get in in the struggle. If we're going to go for the best life. We're going to go for the gold. We're going to go for the ultimate thing, showing off the gospel and illustrating it. Man, there's going to be a wrestling match for the eternal life. There's going to be a wrestling match to have that best kind of life. There's going to be a, a fight so that we stay in it and we experience what God wants us to experience. And so I want to show you how this comes out because I believe that God calls us to something that's great. Everybody at some level loves a deep struggle. You say, no, we don't. Yes, we do. We watch movies about deep struggles. We celebrate people who've overcome deep struggles. That's why we watch the Olympics. These people didn't make it there because they were just naturally talented. They struggled. Some of them fought through asthma and all these kinds of stuff, right, to become world champions. There's always a good struggle. We don't want to be called to something small. We want to be called to something great. And that's going to require some struggle. It's going to require us to press through. God wants to call you to pursue the greatest life, not the small life, not the easy life. He wants to call you to throw off some of the comforts to get into the wrestling match. I know parents all told us, hey, don't don't get in fights. This is one of those fights we can tell our kids and our lives to get into. It's like achieving those A's. It's like getting to be the boss. It's like climbing the corporate ladder. We can put all that aside because we get a chance to go for the gold in the spiritual life. And so Paul tells Timothy, fight. Fight the good fight of the faith. 
Fight for it. Get out there. Fight this good fight. Take hold of that eternal life. Grab it. It's the one you were called and about which one you made the good confession about in the presence of all these people at your baptism, right? Fight for that good faith. Go for it. Man, what a call. Man, what a charge, guys. We get to fight. The Christian life is a fight. It's a wrestling match. It's a struggle. It's not all easy. Put in a pie. And oh, now you come to Jesus and it's all good. And you know, it's been said so often, I think there's an unsaid assumption that Christianity is supposed to be this thing where you give your life to Jesus, sin goes away, you get healthy, wealthy, and wise, and, and now you just wait for Jesus to return, and all the problems of the world just go past you, and then we're all shocked when we have wrestling matches with our kids, when we have issues with our own sin, when we're, our marriages are falling apart, when suddenly we, we go to churches and people have to be fired, and, and ministry people are asked to step down, and you as a volunteer are told, you know, that you don't really work well here, but you probably work well over there and we get all hurt like oh my gosh no the christian life is a fight paul says timothy fight church fight the good fight of the faith take it on push in and you know what if you were one of those people that thought you were weird because you have to fight against your sin if you thought you were one of those people that was weird because it's a fight to stay in prayer it's a fight to stay in your bible and you're like i just must not be a christian because it should be easier than this, right? No. Nope. You are exactly who Paul's talking to. When you know there's a fight, when you sense the struggle, when you know that temptation comes, Paul's yelling, fight! Fight! Go! Go! Fight! Don't stop! Go! Take it on! Wrestle! Struggle! Get back to the Word! Get back to prayer! Fast! Put your life into the fight! It's not easy! And it's normal. Don't feel guilty because it's a fight. That's normal. Everyone is fighting unless they gave up. And then I would say that's a question that you need to struggle with. Why do we quit? One friend told um, um, Stephen years ago, he's, he walked up to him and he's like, I don't struggle with sin because I just gave into it. That's the opposite of a Christian and those who are walking in the faith. The, the Christian is walking in the faith, and that non-Christian there now who is, who is there has set it aside. And so we need to fight for that faith. We need to fight to keep going in that faith. We need to fight to stay in that faith. And you go, well, time out, Greg. What do you mean stay in the faith? I thought you couldn't lose your salvation. Well, I want to be careful in the answer of this because there are really a lot of answers to the question. But let's just put it this way. In the Bible, there are really a couple perspectives. And when it comes to your salvation, as God looks at the world in all of his eternity, God's perspective is those who are saved will never leave. Those who are saved will never leave. He knows all the heart motivations. He knows everything. He knows the whole story. So once saved, yeah, always saved. But from the human perspective, let's just be honest for a minute. From our perspective, we don't know motivations. We don't know who people are. We don't know anything. We don't know the beginning and the end. When God talks directly to us in time, in our place, He says, fight. He says, stay. He says, persevere. He says, go for it. You need to fight for your faith. This is what He tells Timothy at the end of the book. Down here at verse 20, He says, O Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Well, that's odd. Why would we need to guard the gospel that's been given to us? He says, avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge, for by it, check this out, for by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. They left. Over and over and over again, you're going to read in 1 Timothy, you go back and look, of people who were pierced and lost their faith, who, who ran away, who took on this stuff, and their faith was gone because they didn't guard, they didn't fight, they didn't see that the Christian life is a wrestling match to persevere to the end of your life, to stay faithful all the way through, to get moving. And so we want to be honest about the fact that there have been many people who have gone to Olive Branch over the years who are no longer walking with Jesus. And I know it. You can see their Facebook pages. And they're avowedly against Jesus. And it, it burdens me. Because somewhere back there, they stopped fighting where they could have kept fighting. And so maybe that causes you a little fear. You're like, well, how, how, how do I know that, you know, I'm still a Christian? My son is struggling. He's like, how do I know I'm not going to walk away one day? I said, here's the thing. First and foremost, I want you to check yourself. Make sure you're in the faith. First and foremost, are you a Christian? And I love this question. Missionaries in other countries have walked up and said, 
when they meet somebody who says, oh yeah, I'm a Christian. He says, oh, that's amazing, sir. When did you know that you deserve, you are a, you are a sinner who deserved hell? When did you come to the realization that you were a sinner who, who offended God and, and that you needed to make it right with him? When did that happen for you? And he sees that person's ready to tell him, oh, this was the day that that happened, and this is what it, and he's like, oh, that's a Christian. But when they go like, I don't know what you're talking about. I mean, I just grew up in a church, and I've always been this way. And he's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Do you know that you've offended God? You need, a, you need an atoner, the one who's going to bear your sins on the cross. And so hear me for a minute. Maybe you can't answer when you came to realize that you were a sinner who offended God, and you deserve hell. Maybe you're going, I don't deserve hell. Then guess what? You're not a Christian. Every Christian knows they deserve hell. Every single one knows that they have offended the holy and righteous creator of their life in this world, and they want to please him. They don't know how, and they want to be right with him. And yeah, they don't want to go to hell, but they want to be right with God. There's suddenly a transformation in the soul when we receive Jesus. We go, not only am I saved from hell, I want to live for God. He saved me. I love him. He made this world. This is incredible. That heart change, that transformation is what you're looking for. Check yourself. And if you don't see it, you can receive it right now. You can ask God to, to stir your heart and make your heart long for Him and to, to turn from sin, to admit that you deserve the punishment for sin and know that Jesus Christ on the cross has bore it for you. He rose from the dead to give you a life that wants to live eternally for God. It's that eternal life that starts today and starts and is confirmed in eternity, man, this is that chance that you have. You can receive it right now. Don't, don't even hesitate. Don't even listen to the rest of the message. You can, but I want to encourage you. Make it right. And maybe you're sitting there going, well, I, I know that I believe this. I, I trust this, but what if I don't trust him enough? I've had somebody come up to me and say they just wrestle with their faith. They feel like sometimes they don't believe as much as they do. They have doubts. And here's what I told them. I said, listen, it's not your trust that saves you. Okay, here's the problem. We can get caught into trusting our trust. I trust that I trust God so much. Oh, I don't trust that I trust God enough. To, don't, don't trust in your faith. Trust Jesus. Just ask yourself, do you trust that Jesus to, has died on the cross for your sins? If you're like, yes, I trust God's promise. I may have doubts, I may have this, but the bottom line is I trust God's promise. And yeah, you can get those doubts answered. You can struggle through to the answers of those issues. But it comes down to not how well you trust God, but if you trust God. Not trusting your trust, but trust Him. And so I want you guys to understand, we can wrestle through these things and see that it's there. And if you're really wrestling with whether or not you really are saved and you're a Christian, that's probably a good sign. Because last time I checked, it's really Christians who care about whether they're pleasing God. It's really Christians who care whether or not they're going to spend eternity with God, who, who haven't offended God. And so if that's you and you're wrestling through that, maybe that's just a good sign that you're still walking with the Lord. But the bottom line is, Paul answers our question. You want to know if you're really saved? He says, then guard the deposit entrusted to you. Guard it today. Fight for it. Fight for the faith. Live it out now. Keep going. Don't give up. Keep pressing. Keep going after him, and you will stay firm. One of the things that you can simply do as you fight for your faith is to remind yourself of the gospel every day. Old Reformed pastors and people and Puritan pastors and these guys used to say, preach the gospel to yourself daily. To remind yourself that you're a sinner saved by grace. After you sin, sometimes the hardest thing is to get up and realize, I've already been forgiven. He already knew the sins I would commit. Yes, when he died on the cross, he knew all the sins you've already committed and everything you will. That's not a license to sin, but it's a grace to know that when we fail, we can get up, that God wasn't condemning us. He's like, get up, let's go, let's move forward. I want you guys to be encouraged to fight for the faith because there's something more here. And the challenge to not just preach to yourself, but even more to take hold of the faith. Remember what he just said. He said, fight the good fight of the faith. And then he says, take hold of the eternal life which you were called and about which you made the good confession. Now, you're saying like, does that mean I don't have, I have to earn eternal life? That's not what he's saying. In fact, take hold could be translated, experience it. 
Let's just experience the eternal life God has given to you and to me. This is the goal, going for the gold, letting eternal life invade now into your soul. Show off the gospel now through you. As you love people, you're going to sense the eternal life flowing through you. As you're calm and gentle with people, you're going to sense eternal life flowing through you. As you engage in right living with people, you're going to sense eternal life going through you. My friends, my brothers, my sisters, Let's take hold of the eternal life we have. What good is it to buy a Tesla or an amazing car, shove it in your garage and never drive it, never experience it, never enjoy it? God has given you eternal life to enjoy. It started when you were born again. It is there to take hold of now. See, you were called to it. You are called to live in this life. And you're like, but I thought this life like is heaven. Eternal life's later. No. No. Notice, he says, take hold of the eternal life. It's a kind of life. It is the best kind of life. It's the kind of life God has. It's filled with joy. It's filled with blessing. It's filled with rejoicing. It's filled with goodness. It's filled with all of this stuff. And this is what we get to take hold of now. But so many of us are not experiencing it. So many of us are not striving and fighting the good fight of our faith to live with God in the Word, to bring our heart's desires to Him, to lay them down to be satisfied by God and not things of this world. And then when you finally get there, you're going to begin to experience eternal life as you flee from heresy and greed and divisiveness. Run and pursue these character traits of God, and He will speak to you in the Word. He'll speak to you in prayer. He will guide you in living, and you will experience that eternal life that is available today. But you got to fight for it. you got to struggle for it. Don't quit. Don't give up. Keep going because we want to go for the gold. And if you want to go for the gold, let me tell you, then let's live this all out before an awesome God. Let's live it all out before our God who is awesomely incredible. Now, I love that word awesome. It always reminds me of, um, you know, uh, the, the Ninja Turtles. Awesome. You know, that, that one of those words just kind of showed up in our culture in a weird way. But awesome has a great sense to it. And look, we have a calling from God that we should live before that awesome God. In fact, that calling is what we've just gone over to live out eternal life, to have that kind of character that we're pursuing. We just say it this way, to live, or to love Christ, to live for Christ, to share Christ, to allow that, that gospel to be so full of you, it's living out of you, and as you love Christ, and you're living for Him, you're going to share Him, that, that becomes an eternal life thing that you're doing. And so we want to call you to this calling. You have a calling. and not as, Maybe that specific one will come out of this general calling we all have that Paul has just laid down. But then he charges us. He charges Timothy. He says, I charge you in the presence of God before this awesome God who gives life to all things. He'll give you that eternal life that you long for. He's the one who gives it to you, so live it in front of him. And of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, which is that Christ is Lord, that he said, I am the Lord, I am the Christ, right? That's our confession we make as we're baptized. He says, I charge you then to keep the commandment. That's all these things to flee and to pursue and to be engaged with this fight, unstained and free from reproach. Man, let's just keep going. Don't give up. Let's do it as best as we can until the appearing of our Lord Jesus. That's when we stop, when Christ comes, when Christ returns, when he takes you home. That's when we come because he is the one who will display it at the proper time. And so we have this challenge, this call to go, to not quit, to not give up, and to do it in the presence of this awesome God. I keep using the word awesome and I referenced it a little bit. But the best place I've ever noticed awesome is when I approach the Grand Canyon or come out of the tunnel at Yosemite. There is something about walking up to the Grand Canyon when you stand and you're kayaking in the ocean, that there is this immediate, sudden, overwhelming sense of this is so much bigger than me. On one side, I can't stop staring at it. On the other side, I can't stop wanting to be so careful because it feels so deadly. Our God is a multiplier of that. When you approach him, he is a God who is so glorious, so incredible, so amazing. You want to draw near, and yet there is something so overwhelming about his sovereignty, his true goodness, his justice, that we are like, i got to be careful, i got to be careful. It's no wonder the scriptures put it this way. It says, hey, 
Fear the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is insight. And I think that word fear, just throw it out because that's, that's the negative side in our English. The awe of the Lord, where you have just both the awesomeness of God and the awfulness of God, the awe of God, that's the beginning of wisdom. That's the beginning of living. And if we're going to live in this eternal life, we're going to fight this good fight. We're going to ask those questions for that great character. We do it before this God whom we so long to be near, and yet we want to be very careful around because he is so awesome. Do we get that? And so it's no wonder then that we get this sense that we should do this before this God. And then Paul goes, off the rails, just boom, explodes. He's like, I want you to do this before the Lord. In fact, I just can't help it. Let me tell you about him. Again, he says, God, Jesus, who is the blessed? God is, is blessed. He is this one who is the happiest. I love the word stoked. He is, do you ever think of God as joyful? The God in the heavens is just stoked. He's so satisfied. I'm so excited about the world. We always think of him there. You're like, oh man, those sinners. And, ah. and maybe we think of anxious God. He's not. He's blessed. He's like, I got everything I need. I made it all. I have all the joy and the peace of all the rejoicing, all the satisfaction, all the vitality and energy you could ever want. This is blessed. And he goes, guess what? I, I give it to you. You know me. I am making you into my image. Man, I'm the blessed one. I give you blessing. Be blessed. This is our God who is the blessed, the only sovereign. There's no other gods. No one's above him. He's the final arbiter. He is the ultimate rule of good and truth. We don't have to fear and do and, per and perform for some other group of people, some of the God out there, some other way of attaining goodness and being in the presence of God. No, he's the sovereign. He opened the way through Jesus. We trust his rule, his reign, and his gift. Because he's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He's over our governors and our presidents and our dictators and all these things. And ultimately, we may stand before these governments, but they stand before our God. And so we can be confident in this world to walk according to his word, no matter what the world tells us, no matter what the governments say. We will be faithful to him because he will judge them. And we know that he judged us on the cross in Jesus. And so we're free. We can celebrate that he is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is the last arbitrator. He is the final judge. And that he is the one who alone has immortality. Death can't touch him. He's never going to die. He's been alive. He is the grounding for reality. He's why we can know truth. Guys, he is the immortal one and he gives us life. So what we see here now is we don't have to fear somebody's going to kill God. You're not going to get like in the Golden Compass books and we're going to go kill Yahweh. That's all that ridiculous silliness. He's the immortal God. Death can't touch him. He rose from the dead and he's given to you and to me eternal life. And as we've trusted him, death can't touch us. This is who we live life in front of. The one that we cannot destroy. He is with us always. He dwells in an approachable light. He is so good and so pure and so beautiful. He's attractive to us and yet so powerful. We can't approach. It's too much. And yet here is the boundary of all moral good. And we're like, man, you can do whatever you want. And it'll... No, God says, this is, this is light. This is beauty. This is good. This is truth. This is how we should live. And I shine it and we go, oh, it's too much. And yet it's so attractive. He is the pure moral standard. We don't have to make anything up when he gives us what we need. We are going to stand before him. And yet right now on earth, this is the one who has never been seen or can see. And yet, we know that Jesus Christ is God on earth. And this unapproachable light has come to be seen. And this one who has never been seen, John tells us, he has revealed God to us as one who has sat at his bosom, who's known him intimately. And what we see is this beautiful thing about God is that while he is so transcendent, so huge, so great, so good, so immortal, so overwhelming, and we're to live in front of him with awe, Jesus Christ has enabled it to be one in which we can rejoice and enjoy him. We have the promise that we will see God. And when we're resurrected and the sin is gone and the rebellion is over, we will be able to stand in the presence of the holy God knowing that we resonate with him and we will not be destroyed by him because there is no longer sin. We stand in the righteousness of God. We enjoy the ultimate eternal life that began when we were born again. It's no wonder he says to him, 
be the honor and the eternal dominion. Amen. And that's what should motivate us. I don't know about you, but I wanted to go for the gold when my dad was present. I got the opportunity to throw discus in high school, and I worked and worked and worked at it. And one day, it was my dad's birthday. He was watching. He finally didn't have a track meet at the school he worked at, so he showed up, and he was standing before me. And, I, and he actually got to go out to measure. And so I was just so encouraged and excited. I threw that thing as hard as I could. I ended up setting the school record, my own personal record, obviously. And, and my dad was there to measure it on his birthday. And it was a motivation to me because of the presence of my father. God is with us. And he has inspired these words to say, go for the gold. Go for it. Go for that character. Pursue it. Fight that good fight. Don't give up. Endure. Do it before me. I am here. I'm giving you life. I have given you this call. Do it before me. And I believe that can be the greatest motivator as we know God sits in the stands and he says, I've given you this. Take hold of it. Enjoy it. Don't quit. Go for the gold. Not when people leave your life. Not when you've been insulted. Not when you've got the wealth and the riches of the world. Not when everything is perfect. Not when times are hard. Not when times are simply and easy and your marriage is good, but then not when your marriage is failing. Not when your kids rebel and not when they give their lives to Jesus. Don't quit. Don't think that it's over. Keep fighting. Keep going when your house burns down, when everything goes bankrupt, when they've got you locked in chains and they persecute you and they throw you before lions and they want to kill you. Don't quit. Stand with the church in history who has been faithful to endure. Let's go for the gold. Wage the warfare. Fight the good fight. Pursue the character. It is ours to take hold of. Eternal life is here in Jesus Christ and you can have it. My encouragement is go. Go for the gold. Father, I just ask that you would help us to be the people who pursue, pursue this character. That we become a people who are ready to take hold of eternal life, fighting that good fight, not giving up. Thank you for the encouragement. We want to do this before you. You who has given us life, you who has given us all that we need, we want to do this before you. Oh, Lord, help us to go for that gold every single day. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, this is me encouraging you with the same fingers I give right now. So, And this is from our curriculum that we formed called Knowing You. This is our small group series, the time of the year where we press into spiritual growth and call you guys to gather in groups. And this series is exciting. And the point that we're trying to make here is often what happens to me. I'll try to type in a destination that I want to go to, but my GPS hasn't caught up to where I am. And so it tells me like the wrong directions and sends me in these random places. It tells me I got five hours left. And the point is you can't figure out where you're going until you know where you are. And in the spiritual life, it's the same. You can't know what God's calling you to do if you don't know yourself. We're going to go into six weeks of how the Bible calls us and shows us how to know who we are. The world has lots of ways to figure out your identity, personality, and all your value and all this stuff. And all of them will lead you in circles and ultimately in despair. But the way of Jesus and the way of the Bible wants to help you discover who you are so that you can make appropriate plans and goals to grow spiritually in the next years because you know yourself. You've got it figured out. So that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be doing it in groups. And so we want to encourage you. Maybe you have a couple friends that are around you that you think, hey, they don't have a group, we don't have a group. I want to encourage you to start a group. And the best way you can do that is simply invite them over and then let us know. And you can get on at obcc.group. That's obcc.group. And we'll give you all the information and curriculum so you can facilitate this opportunity of a new small group at your house and with your friends. Look, you got questions, let us know. We want to encourage you forward. It doesn't have to be difficult and we give you the curriculum and all the direction and you can connect with us at obcc.group and we'll help you out. We're just glad you'd even consider it. Pray for this. We're excited about where we're going and uh, we would love to connect with you. God bless you and we will see you guys next week.